I'm Jack Moffitt. I work for Mozilla Research, and I work on the lead on the Servo project, which is a new experimental web browser that we're building. Um, and if you're wondering where the inspiration of the name came, I tried to make it really obvious on the slide uh, where our sense of humor lies. So Servo has a lot of goals. One of them is to be a modern, br modern browser engine, whatever that means. And I'm going to hopefully explain that to you so that you're on the same page as that we are. Lots of technology suffers from path dependence, meaning that decisions that you make about implementing that technology uh, affect the future. Specifically, decisions that you make a long time ago in the past about the implementation affect the decisions that you make today, even though those old decisions are completely irrelevant. Um, and browsers, of course, are entirely path dependent. Current browsers were designed 15 years ago. Uh, the whole landscape was different. You had different hardware. It was all single cores. It was you know, slower. Now we have lots more cores. So they're a little bit faster. Um, the standards were different. You had CSS. It was not supported in some of the early browsers. A lot of this stuff that we have now that's sort of baked in and we think of as the web just didn't exist. Audio, video. Uh, we have new standards arriving every day, like HTTP2. Uh, JavaScript was way different. Before, it was just kind of like this little toy you could use to make things scroll across the screen or check your form fields for validation. Now we have real apps that we write in JavaScript. We write games in JavaScript. It's become a pretty fundamental piece of what we think of as the web. Um, the whole web itself was different. I mean, it used to be you would surf the web, right? You would be reading one site, and there would be like a little web ring, and it would take you to links to other sites that were kind of similar, and you would read. And now we use it completely differently. We have word processors that we use there. We live there. We have whole operating systems that run on phones that are made out of the same technology. And the security was way different. So back then, we didn't worry about attacks. Like, your defense against an attack against your, uh, some web application was making sure they couldn't FTP into your server and replace the files. And now you have to make sure that they can't uh, you know, steal data from your client or use your browser to attack some other target or run arbitrary code on your machine. So what pieces, th th these are all things that are completely different. And so what pieces from this path dependent uh, route that the browsers evolved over can we change or, or, or can we throw away? Um, you know, some examples of this are uh, script parsing and execution. You have to, when you parse an HTML page, as soon as you hit a script, you basically have to execute the script and stop parsing. And you can't actually continue parsing until the script is finished. And this is kind of baked in to the specs. The sites depend on this. And if you change it, things break. Um, so we can't change that, unfortunately. Um, native widgets used to be really important, right? Form like the original versions of Safari, or maybe even current ones, had form fields that looked just like all the other OSX buttons. These days, nobody cares, because you know, the whole operating system is in the web, and if it looks like OSX, it doesn't matter. Um, but there are real technical decisions that have to be made to work around all these issues with integrating native widgets. It's just one example. We have sync versus async APIs. We used to do everything synchronously. Now we do lots of stuff asynchronously. It would be nice to have some of those asynchronous APIs for the web. Um, and we have lots of things that we can't fix. Another example is floats. You can't really parallelize layout with floats. If we were designing this again today, we would probably fix that. So Servo wants to fix some of these things. Um, we want to target a sort of modern web, I guess you could call it. And of course, we're starting from scratch, <laughs> like almost literally from scratch. Um, with the one caveat that we're very aware of what others have done. This is a project inside Mozilla. We have lots of layout engineers and rendering engineers and all kinds of other engineers that you need to make browsers in Mozilla. They all remember mistakes that they made, and we get to profit from their advice. Uh, there are at least two other big browser engines that are also open source that we can learn from and interact with those teams. And we need to implement enough of a web browser that we can experiment and find out you know, which of these ideas are good and which of them won't work at all. But we can't implement so much of a web browser that we have the same problem that current browsers have, which is it's too hard to change. We can't run experiments because there's six million lines of code to have, you have to update to change your mind on this one decision. The current browsers are so large that it, you know, it, it makes it really hard to experiment with them. So we need to do something new, or at least we feel that way. 
And the goal is to explore and experiment. We want to try what are the new ways that we can solve problems? You know, what kinds of new optimizations can we find while we solve them? Can we parallelize stuff? Um, how much of the stuff can we parallelize? Can we parallelize it without breaking what the web currently does? What can we gain if we do break the web in specific ways in order to gain more parallelism, for example? What new technologies can we invent that will help us parallelize more of the web in the future? For instance, if there, is, is there a new API we can introduce or a new image format or something that would solve a, a large class of problems for people? Can we design a safer browser? Right now, uh, whenever you implement some DOM API in Gecko or in Chrome uh, or any of these other large C++ code bases, you know, small security bugs and these sort of incidental APIs off to the side can have huge ramifications because if you can exploit a bug in one piece of the code, then you generally you have access to the rest of it, uh, modulus sandboxing. And the other thing is, can we make browsers easier to create and modify? Uh, an example of this is if you want to add a new DOM API in a browser or add a new layout property, you have to touch a lot of code. And you have to be really confident that it's right. Um, and a lot of people have to look over your shoulder to make sure you're not doing something dumb. And so hopefully we can make that easier too. And we're also experimenting by using this new, also a Mozilla research project, uh, language called Rust, which is you know, for fast, concurrent, and safe programming. Now, we try to have the same performance profile as C++, and we think we're pretty close. We're also memory safe, which means you don't have null pointers, and you can't uh, dereference a pointer that's already been freed. You can't accidentally use uninitialized memory. All of these things that are you know, big, huge problems in C++ can happen uh, when you're programming in the safe language of Rust, uh, or at least we hope they can't happen. <laughs> uh, we also have you know, sort of high-level concurrency abstractions. So Rust has tasks that you can use, which are kind of like lightweight threads, and tasks can communicate with message passing. And so some of the questions that we have here are, is this enough to write a safe browser? Like, are these abstractions uh, enough to get the job done? Does it make it easy to write parallelism for mere mortals where you don't have to have 17 people checking your code and decades of bug fixes? Um, and of course, if the answer to any of these questions are no, like Rust is an experiment as well, it's sort of in a feedback loop with the browser itself. And so if we find you know, that Rust isn't up to the task, we change Rust just like we change Servo. So I think the, one of the main motivations of the project and, and the reason we focus so much on parallelism is if you look at this uh, image, this is a Pinterest board, there certainly seems to be a lot of parallelism on the web, right? Each of these images is completely independent. You can de decode it independently. Each of these little blocks with little comments and stuff is all independent. There's no reason that interaction or changes in one of these blocks really affect anything that's going on with another block. Uh, but current browsers certainly don't treat the web this way. They're all serial. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what the current browsers are doing. So how many of you know how browsers work? Well, I certainly didn't before I started this, so <laughs> you're not alone. Um, this is a sort of high-level diagram of what happens. So you have, uh, you know, you type in a URL to your web browser, it's gonna load the page, parse the page, and it constructs a data structure called the DOM tree, which probably many of you are familiar with. And once we have a DOM tree, we have to figure out uh, we have to calculate all the layout stuff. So where do these things actually end up on the page? So we run all these calculations. We end up with a list of stuff to draw on the screen. Once we have a list of stuff we can draw on the screen, we can hand it to something to draw it on the screen. At that point, we can kind of wait for user interaction uh, and things to happen. So we wait for things to happen. The user does something like clicking on a link or, or moving the mouse around or any of these things. Uh, these create JavaScript events and the script executes. It does all kinds of things. One of the kinds of things it does is to modify the DOM tree. And once you modify the DOM tree, now you go all the way back around the loop. Now you want this to be really, really fast. And there's two ways to make this fast. One is that you can not go all the way around the loop. You can skip parts. So for example, if you modify the DOM tree and you're calculating layout, um, you don't necessarily, if you're in a loop, you kind of want to batch up all your layout changes into one big piece to render. So you just go back to running more JavaScript and, and cut out the, essentially the bottom half of this. 
And the other way you can make it fast is to make in each individual component very fast. And the main way you do this is by doing everything incrementally. So if you make changes to the DOM tree, we don't calculate layout for the whole DOM tree. You'd only calculate layout for the bits that changed. And similarly, for a display list, you figure out what changed since the old display list, and you can try to render just the little tiny sections that change. Um, so you do things incrementally. But as you can see, this is a big loop. Um, in, in terms of you know, what's sort of the programming interface to this is it looks like this, right? Script is running, makes some changes, layout runs. And script is running, layout runs. So there's a big problem with this, and it's just a single threaded thing. It, it all goes by itself. So if you think about how you might improve this, you might have some interesting ideas. Um, we had some of these ideas. Uh, and we decided it might be a good idea to run script and layout at the same time. Like, this is one of the big experiments that we're doing. We're not sure if it's going to work. But we're pretty confident that we're on to something here. And we think it's really important. So this makes the diagram just a little bit different. So now you run script. It generates some you know, lay DOM changes. So you need to calculate layout. But as soon as you trigger like, you know, the calculation of layout, you just go back to running script again. Um, it's great. So now you have you know, essentially two times the performance, maybe. <laughs> um, of course, this doesn't always work, because we have these nasty things in JavaScript uh, that read information that's layout based. So you have get, cl uh, get client bounding rect, or bounding client rect, I guess, which basically says, you know, hey, I have this element. Where is it on the screen? And in order to figure out where it is on the screen, of course, we have to run all the layout calculations. So we won't be able to continue script execution until we have the data. But performance-wise, it seems like this could potentially be a big win. And implementation-wise, it turns out it's really simple. Um, and, and I'll show an example of why that is in a little while um, with, uh, when we see partial layout. So this is the main, one of the main experiments. So there's a problem here, which is that if you have layout and script going at the same time, they have this shared data structure, the DOM, that they both have to operate on. They're actually both reading it and writing it. Um, the JavaScript code is you know, reading it to see what the values of properties are and writing it to set new values of properties. The layout code obviously has to read a lot of these properties to figure out where stuff goes on the screen. And it also propagates the style information and all kinds of stuff throughout the data structure. So it's also writing to there. And a big constraint here is we're competing with the performance of single-threaded browsers. So it's not enough here just to say, oh, we're going to put some locks on here. And that way, no two threads can be modifying the same node, for example. Or, or you know, even an atomic uh, you know, lock-free data structure has performance implications um, that, that probably won't get us the, in the same ballpark of performance as a native browser, which doesn't have to do sort of any, any of these things. It can just treat the data uh, however it likes. Um, and of course, we need it to be safe. Um, you know, we can't just race on all this data and hope that everything works. Um, we want some kind of uh, guarantees or assurances that it'll be good. An example of this is, you know, if script is making changes to element style, say you set the background color to red, and then you set the text color to black or something like that, if you, um, if you, if you don't handle this case properly, you might render the intermediate state here, where in, a, in Firefox or, or Chrome, you would see a node that has you know, some properties before, and then a background property of red and a text property of black. You, know, you might see it might change to red first and then change the text color. So we don't want that. Also, if script was going through and deleting nodes, layout might be running calculations that needed that information. And then, of course, you might crash, uh, or something else bad would happen. So the thing we are doing to try to solve this problem, we call the copy on write DOM. So the key thing here is that layout always sees the same data structure, the same version of the data structure. This is always going to be layout's view of it is going to be blue in, in these next couple of slides. And this blue data structure is effectively immutable in ter as far as layout is concerned. Or, or really, layout can write to it, uh, but it, but it can't see any changes that happen from other parts of the system. So imagine now that we have some JavaScript code, and it wants to change the A, the A node to uh, have a red background color. So what does that look like? So we copy the A node to a new node, um, totally independent. Layout can't see it. Uh, 
And then we change, there's two sets of pointers for all of the nodes. One is a clean set of pointers that lay out C's and traverses, and the other is the dirty set of pointers that script can manipulate. So here, script has added a dirty pointer to a child to point to A, and A has a pointer back to the original piece of the tree, which hasn't changed. So layout still sees the same version of the tree. Script now has a version of the tree it can work on, and everybody's happy. So what happens if we keep going? Like if we change the child of A, we copy you know, that node, and we have the pointers updated. So now there's sort of this extra version of the tree hanging off to the side. And this keeps going for as many changes as script needs to make. And now what happens is at the end, this layout will have, will have completed running. And so before it starts the next version of layout, we basically remove the old nodes of the tree, um, and we take the dirty ones, and we change, you know, we basically copy all the values in the dirty pointers to the clean pointers, and now we have a new version of the tree. And this will be the new sort of immutable version of tree that layout will see, and now script can go off and do its thing again. Um, and we, we think this should be pretty fast. So how is, how do we make this safe? So Rust type system is sort of a key ingredient in enforcing the safety of these operations. Uh, essentially, underneath the covers, there's one data structure in memory, but it's exposed as two different structures or, or you know, two different objects in the type system. And each of these different objects has different methods and different fields that it can look at. And the compiler can essentially statically guarantee that you're not you know, doing something you shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, leaks are, are, are pretty much not allowed, and, and, and nodes can't really escape, uh, which, helps, which helps make sure you're not doing the wrong thing. Okay, okay so that's the cow dom, we call it. Now let's talk about parallel layout. So before we can talk about parallel layout, probably uh, better start with how, lay, you know, how layout works in the current browsers. Um, current browsers, and Servo has this as well, they have this parallel data structure. In Gecko, it's called the frame tree. I think in WebKit, it's called the render tree. Uh, in Servo, we call it the flow tree. It's a parallel data structure uh, that sort of links back to the DOM and has uh, essentially, you can think of it as like the containing blocks of the page are represented here. And when you want to calculate layout information, you basically start at the top and you say, you know, layout. And, and the way Gecko does this is essentially a C++ virtual function call that says, you know, it, it talks to all its kids and says, go do your layout. And then the kids talk to their kids and say, go do your layout. Now the thing here is because it's just a virtual method call, you know, all, all of those virtual methods, all these implementations of go, you know, go do layout can access any part of the tree they want. They can do whatever they want. They can look at their parents, they can look at their children, they can look at their grandchildren, they can look at their grandparents, they can reach all the way over somewhere in another subtree and check out what's over there. Um, this makes it almost impossible to parallelize because you have no idea how the data is being accessed. So, and because these traversals can do anything, there's nothing in the C++ type system or the implementation that prevents you from doing this stuff, uh, it, it gets done all over the place. So it's kind of a, a, a bit of a mess. Um, so in Servo, we have a separate data structure as well called the flow tree, but our traversals are quite different and we, we sort of, our goal is to design this structure such that it makes the traversals really simple and easy to express and easy to parallelize. So this is what our traversals look like. They're, they're in Servo, they're on the flow tree. I'm just showing the DOM tree here because it's, it's easier. Um, you have three passes. You basically go from the bottom up and you say, okay, I know how big I'm supposed to be, tell my parent, and you know, it, it collects all those and goes up. So you bubble up these like sort of preferred and intrinsic widths to the top of the tree. Once you have all those, you can go back down and say, okay, now that I know what everything wants, to, how everything wants to be sized, I can actually assign it some width and then once you get all the way back to the bottom, you go back up and assign the height. So, and then once you're, at the, once you're at the top and you assign the height for the page, then you're, you're done. So when these kinds of traversals are easy to parallelize, for example, in a top-down case, you can just spawn a new task for all your children, and they can spawn new tasks for all their children, and so on and so forth. And, and the bottom-up traversals also can be parallelized. Now there's, an issue here, like uh, as I said before, well, floats can't really be paralyzed. So if you have sort of a subtree of, of these things that has floats in it, then you actually have to walk that in order because 
if you, if you have uh, one node that's floating, then it kind of affects you know, how wide the siblings can be. So there are some cases where you can't parallelize. But in general, we want to get to this structure so that you can parallelize at least the bulk of it. An interesting thing here is that Rust is actually uh, can express this kind of parallelism very well. Um, it can guarantee that basically you're not, um, you're not uh, racing on data. So for example, when we do these traversals, the type system will make sure that we never access anything but our children as we go down the tree. We can't access siblings or our parents, um, which you need to make sure that you can parallelize it. Otherwise, you know, two subtrees that are going in parallel could be you know, racing on some piece of data. So Rust helps us make this uh, safe um, at compile time, which is really nice. Um, and the design of the data structure makes it so we have some chance of getting parallelism out of it. Another thing that we just actually finished, or not finished, we'll probably never finish, but um, that we just sort of got the initial version of working is parallel iframes. So iframes you're probably already, already familiar with, uh, just let you put a web page in another web page. Um, and there's really two cases of this. In the first case, the iframes are sort of, sort of from your own site. So here we have an outer page and it has two iframes, a blue one and a red one. They're all from the same site. Um, when they're all from the same site, they get to interact with each other. And because they can interact with each other, you can't run them in parallel. You have to run them in the exact same JavaScript runtime. So uh, one fallout of this is if you know, the blue iframe is doing some long calculation, and now the red iframe stops, and it can't run, um, which is not very nice. Now in the cross-origin case, for security reasons, these are isolated from each other. You don't want, you know, if you're on a banking website and it has an ad in it that's in an iframe, you don't want the ad to be able to reach out and get your banking details. So the scripts, the, the DOMs aren't allowed to interact with each other, or they're only allowed to interact in very specific isolated ways. Um, and, and since that's the case, we can run these in parallel. Now other browsers don't do this. Uh, they could. Uh, they don't currently, but Servo runs these in parallel. And actually, the outer page will have uh, you know, a script task, like we saw, a layout task. Those will be running in parallel. We also have a rendering task that will run in parallel with those two. And then each of these iframes will also have a layout, a script, and a rendering task that will run in parallel. And that means that if you have some heavy computation on, in the blue iframe, it won't even affect the outer page or the, or the red iframe on the other side. Now, HTML5 added this sandbox attribute to, to iframes so that you can get this kind of security isolation even in the case where they're on the same origin. Now, if you're using a sandbox iframe, it's also, since we have this isolation, there's no reason we can't run them in parallel. And so Servo does that too. So in the same origin case, you can also have parallel iframes if you use the sandbox attribute. So this is actually a new kind of parallelism that doesn't exist currently on the web that we're enabling with Servo. I'm not sure you know, how people will end up using this new feature, essentially. Um, but we have some ideas about what people might use it for. Um, one is that you could decode video now in JavaScript, because you could run the video decode in an iframe. It could show you the movie. And even if it took you know, quite a bit of CPU to decode, it was not going to affect the other elements on the page. JavaScript can still execute elsewhere. You can still interact with the page. I I'll show this in a demo in just a little bit. Uh, not, not video decode, but, but the parallelism there. Um, another thing is, uh, currently, if you want to get any kind of parallelism in JavaScript, you have to use a web worker. And web workers can't access the DOM, which means that if you're writing a game and you want to have, uh, you know, do something off in another thread, which you would do in C++, in, 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 on the web, you pretty much have to do it in a web worker. But a web worker, since it can't have the DOM, you can't draw to a canvas, you can't call WebGL. So you're pretty restricted in what you can do. But if you have a parallel iframe, you have a DOM. You can call WebGL. You can render textures uh, off in an iframe or draw on some canvas and ship the bits back over. Um, it'll be really interesting to see if this is a, uh, gives game developers the ability to do something new. And then, of course, back to the ad example, if you have some terribly behaved ad that came off an ad network and it's running in an iframe, it won't destroy your browsing experience. Like, like in Gecko, you know, the whole browser Chrome is also written in JavaScript and running in the same JS runtime. So you know, if one of these iframes misbehaves, like you can't even scroll or you know, you know, browse to a new site. 
Uh, okay, and then the last sort of example is partial layout. Now, I don't think anyone implements partial layout in the other browsers. This is an idea that we saw kicking around on the Blink uh, mailing list, and so because they were talking about it, we started talking about, you know, what would it take to implement this in Servo? And it turns out that this, these, some of these design decisions that we made, um, we, we think are, are, are getting validated by looking at these kinds of problems, because it turns out it makes these kinds of optimizations very easy to make. So partial layout probably requires a little bit of explanation. So the idea is that if you change the property, say we change the font size on this A tag, and then we immediately say, like, where is this A tag on the screen? So normally what a browser would do is it would run all of the layout calculations for the whole tree, or at least the part of the tree that changed, and then, as soon, and then you know, after it's all done, it would give you the answer. Here's where the A tag is. But of course, we can do better than this, right? Like, the A is pretty high up in the tree. It's possible that you know, we know where it is relatively early in the layout calculations. So it would be nice just to say, oh, all you care about is where A is. So we figured out where A is now. So let's stop the rest of layout, and we'll just hand you back the answer. Um, so it's an it's, it's a easy, I, I think it's a relatively straightforward thing to imagine. Um, now, if you're going to implement this in sort of a normal browser, you have code that runs script. You have more code that runs script. It eventually gets to running layout calculations. It runs more layout calculations. So right now, basically, at the end of layout, then you would, you know, the information would be uh, sent back up to the top. And with, with uh, partial layout, basically, you're just shortcutting this. So we have the answer earlier, so we just send it back up to the top earlier. But there's kind of a problem with this in that what about this code down here? It didn't run. So we calculated this you know, the position of this A tag and presumably some other stuff that was around it or, or nearby, but there's still a whole bunch of layout that we say didn't run yet. And now what happens is if, you know, we make more changes and then we need to lay out the page, we have to restart layout essentially from the beginning. Um, and we have to duplicate that work that we already did just to get the work that we didn't do. There's probably all kinds of ways to fix this, but it, it makes the control flow really, really hairy. So in Servo, this is a little bit easier because we have two different tasks running independently that do essentially the same thing. So if layout gets the data early, we can just send a message over to the other task saying, here's the information you wanted. But crucially now, it can just keep going. It can keep running and finish running the rest of layout. Um, and it doesn't bother the script task at all. There's no hairy control flow. This is just doing what it normally does all day. Um, because these are separate tasks, it makes this uh, sort of these optimizations really easy to realize. Um, and we don't have to duplicate work. We don't have to make sure that the optimization wins enough that it pays for this cost that we paid to duplicate this little bit of layout that we already did. So since Servo's architecture seems to make this much easier, um, in fact, it makes this kind of optimization enough easier that, that, you know, one thing you might think of is that maybe it's worth running script and layout concurrently even in the case that it's not much of a performance win in terms of like it's not gonna double the performance but it makes the code way simpler. Uh, so we feel, I feel like this is a good validation of some of our early design work. And there's a whole lot of other places that we're trying to get parallelism here. So rendering, compositing, and animation, uh, we can all ship off to the GPU or at least ship a large subset off of it to the GPU. Currently we already do rendering and compositing on the GPU. Modern browsers uh, do compositing uh, a couple of them do rendering on the GPU. There's no reason they couldn't. They just, not all of them do it yet. CSS selector matching is an embarrassingly parallel problem that no one has parallelized, really. It's, it's still, you know, academia have, have written sort of parallel selector matchers, and they sort of just have not trickled into the production implementations. Uh, box model solving, that's the parallel layout that we, we saw already, you know, just making sure all the CSS calculations can get parallelized somehow. Um, text shaping is really interesting. When you have like a box of text, you have to figure out how big each of the words are. So you can figure out how wide the lines are and where to break them. Um, but each of the words is relatively independent, so you can, uh, you know, do the shaping uh, to figure out where they are all independently. That's actually fairly expensive to do, so it would be really nice uh, to be able to do it parallel. It should also be sort of embarrassingly parallel. Uh, media handling. I sort of talked about um, you could parse HTML in parallel, you could parse CSS in parallel if you can figure out how to do it. Um, 
currently the, the sort of best we have for this is uh, current browsers, you know, decode images and, and parse stuff off the main thread, which is about as close as, as people have gotten so far. You can also do speculation. So in, in, when I talked earlier about how when you're parsing an HTML file and you hit a script tag, you pretty much have to stop parsing, execute the script because it might do a document.write or otherwise uh, modify the DOM right there. You can speculate that it's not going to do that and then you know, keep going. And then if it does, sort of undo the work. Um, so you do extra work in some cases, but in other cases you just get done faster. And of course garbage collection is, is, is kind of another interesting one. In the case where we have script and, and layout running in parallel, if, as soon as you, even if you can't, even if script has got a block on layout, as soon as you move over to doing layout work, you might as well run the JavaScript garbage collector because now you're not doing anything else on that task. So we're trying to see how much parallelism we can get, how fine-grained we can get it. Um, hopefully we'll be successful. So I wanted to show a little demo uh, so you can see that Servo's working. It's not just in my imagination. Let's see. So first, let's see if I can find. This is gonna be Gecko. So I'm gonna show you the parallel iframe. So what's happening here is in this iframe, we're just running a simple animation loop. We change the image source of this image uh, there's eight different images, and we just go in a loop changing it. On this side, we're actually multiplying a 900 by 900 matrix. So it's a computation that's kind of expensive. It takes about two seconds to do. And you can see that you know, it, it rests for a while, and then it'll start multiplying these matrices, and as soon as it does, you see this animation just completely stops. And not only does the animation completely stop, but I think if I, if I try to like zoom, let me find. So I can zoom here zoom in and out, and as soon as that animation stops, you can see the whole UI is unresponsive. So this is not very good. This, of course, is also the case in other browsers. Wow, this is kind of hard to do with two windows. And it works pretty much exactly the same. So here it stopped, finished, now it's going again, and it'll stop as soon as that kicks in again. Now Chrome is actually a little bit better because you, know, you can still interact with the browser Chrome while this is happening and it doesn't really affect your life too much. Now let's look at Servo. Oops. So here's Servo. So we actually have an old version of SpiderMonkey running here, so the matrix multiplication takes a lot longer. It is happening, it'll, it'll, it'll take a few seconds for it to appear. But notice that not only is the R continuing to spin, where's my mouse cursor? Come on. Oh, that's a bug. <laughs> that's not a parallelism bug, that's like a, data, like a good old data race. Um, there we go. You can still zoom in while it's going. Um, let's see, if I zoom in, then you can see I can still scroll around. All while this is calculating, it's pretty much the, the sort of jankiness that you see is just because we haven't really written a real shell. Um, sorry, it stopped again, nice. There's a couple of bugs in it still. So, but that's pretty cool, right? Um, another thing that we can do uh, and I can't really show this in another browser because I don't have a working zero-day exploit. Uh, but I can show you in Servo because I know how to exploit that one. So Rust has tasks, and tasks have sort of this Erlang model of you can tell if they failed, and it isolates the failure. So imagine you have one of these iframes in a browser, and something bad happens, and it fails, like it triggers a bug in layout or something, and it just fails. So in, in, you know, if this is in a tab, like the whole tab will come down in Chrome. In Firefox, it might take down the whole browser or whatever. Um, in an iframe, even in Chrome, it'll take down the whole tab. The, the whole page has to come down. In Servo, since we run the iframes in their own tasks, oh, I can't. So here's basically the same demo. And now here's another iframe, and this is a link to a page that causes Servo to crash. And if I click it, 
it intercepts the crash. It just gives us an error message. So we can intercept failure for like, you know, more fine-grained components of the page to prevent you know, the rest of the page from being affected at all. That's pretty cool. Like I said, I'd like to show you that in the other browsers, but I think I would, you know, for starters, I think it would get me a couple tens of thousands of dollars in reward money um, to demo a new exploit. But Okay, so where are we and where are we going? So we just managed to pass ACID1. So this is our, refer this is our ren the servo's rendering of ACID1 currently. Um, it's a layout focused test that focuses a lot on floats and, and it, you know, all these things with the CSS box model like asymmetric borders and border sizes and margins and padding and all that good stuff. Um, basically, if you can pass ACID1, Wikipedia starts to look kind of like a regular web page. Um, this is the reference image difference from our rendering. Um, you're allowed to have differences in text rendering since that's almost impossible to keep the same across platforms. Uh, we thought this was really cool, so we celebrated. We had a cake made. This cake almost passes ACID1 itself. Obviously, it doesn't have text, but since that's okay, you know. <laughs> uh, it's got a cool. So, so today we have, uh, we have script and layout running concurrently. We have parallel iframes, which we just did. Um, we render on the GPU. We composite on the GPU. We are the only browser with quad, quad tree uh, tile rendering, so whenever we render graphics to the screen, we divide the whole thing up into tiles, and then we manage those in a quad tree. This makes it really easy to say, find tiles that we should evict from memory uh, when we're scrolling or something to make room for new tiles. They're, you know, close in some sense. To uh, it's easy to find tiles that are far away and close. Uh, we have basic navigation. It's, you know, we hit the ba you hit backspace to go backwards and shift backspace to go forwards which I thought was really silly until I realized that's what all the other browsers did too. <laughs> uh, we have basic DOM APIs now. We just started adding these. Uh, we have, you know, set attribute, create element, append child. Some of those you were able to see in the demo. We still have a lot of DOM API implementation stuff to do. And it works on Linux, Mac, and, and sometimes on Android. We haven't got the Android one in our continuous integration system, so it gets broken a lot, but that should be fixed fairly soon. And in the future, these are the things, I mean, I, sh I told you about most of the stuff we're hoping to lay out, uh, hoping to accomplish. Like parallel layout's a big one. Incremental layout, where we only recalculate the layout for the pieces of the DOM that have changed, is a really important one. Um, part of the problem here is that, you know, we want to have benchmarks, like how good are we compared to Firefox or Safari or IE? And it, you have to do an, a huge amount of engineering work just to get to the point where you can do a test that's reasonable, right? Like, uh, you know, one of the original tests that we tried to do was, you know, set some DOM property in a loop and then immediately ask for where it is on the screen. So now you have to go through the whole script layout cycle and time that. And then we found out Gecko was way faster than us. And when we investigated, we found out that it was basically a no-op in Gecko because it was optimizing it out. And so then we made the test slightly worse. And then we found, okay, well, Gecko is only, you know, recalculating some very small part of the layout tree. And we recalculate the whole layout tree every time. So we have to implement all of this stuff just to get to the point where we can make some kind of comparison to figure out if our work is in the right direction. Uh, we're very serious about making this embeddable. Uh, you know, Gecko isn't easy to embed. Uh, WebKit was, and WebKit got embedded everywhere. With Servo, we plan to make embeddable from the start. JS Managed DOM is kind of hard to explain, but essentially all the DOM data structures are you know, native code data structures. They're C++ objects in, in Gecko. In Servo, they're Rust objects, and JavaScript needs to be able to talk to them, so they have these little wrappers that allow the JS engine to talk to the C++ object. It turns out it's too expensive to just create these wrappers all the time, so you create them lazily, so most DOM nodes never get accessed from JavaScript. So it's, exp it's, it's so expensive, like, it's a tiny little piece of memory, right? But it's still expensive enough to allocate this wrapper that uh, you don't want to do it. So we're, we're, we have some new ideas for how to do that. We're working with the SpiderMonkey team to, to do that. Um, we're, we're currently using um, NetSurf CSS, which is a C library for style sheet parsing and, and um, doing, doing um, the cascade. Uh, we're, we're, we're rewriting that all in Rust right now. Um, and then we're, pretty soon we'll be able to have some actual benchmarks and we have almost enough DOM stuff to start running the conformance tests to find out you know, which pieces of the DOM APIs we conform to. And lastly, I, I would love for you guys to help us build Servo. We can't do this by ourselves. 
Um, if you're interested in Rust and don't have a project yourself to work on, uh, servos written in Rust, come, please come help us. Um, you can program in a new language, making significant contributions to a new web browser. Um, I have a whole list of projects. There's a list in the bug tracker on GitHub of things marked easy. So if you're not sure about how web browsers are implemented, you're just interested, or you're just looking to have some fun, there's a lot of cool stuff to do there. Um, you can find us on GitHub. We hang out in Pound Servo on the Mozilla IRC server. There's a mailing list if you want to just follow along and lurk and see what we're up to. And if you have any questions for me, I'm on Twitter at, at MetaJack, and there's my email address. Um, thanks. <laughs>